Being recorded. Good morning. Uh, I'm the Region 2 Regional ADA Compliance Specialist. Each one of your regions should have an ADA Compliance Specialist. Um, what we're going to cover today is going to be uh, ADA ramps, mainly just the curb ramps. ADA is a very complex topic. We're going to focus on curb ramps today. This short session is not going to answer all your questions about ADA and pedestrian facilities, but it's the intention is to give you a basic understanding of ADA and New York State DOT requirements for curb ramps. Inspection determine if curb ramps have been met and what to do if they haven't been met. Some common issues encountered in the field. And at the end, we're going to have a brief question and answer period. So if you have any questions, uh, I'd appreciate it if you could please save it to the end. The Americans with Disabilities Act was signed over 25 years ago. It's a wide ranging law that prohibits discrimination based on any disability. We tend to think of ADA as being for wheelchair users, but it's meant to serve all types of disabilities, including mobility, visual, cognitive disabilities. It's not only for permanent disabilities, but also temporary ones. The standard for ensuring access is ADA guidelines. These are developed by the U.S. Access Board and enforced by the U.S. Department of Justice. The Department of Justice has designated the FHWA, which is the Federal Highway Administration, to oversee compliance for highways. There's two sets of ADA guidelines that apply to all New York State DOT highway projects, 1991 ADAG and the 2011 PROAG. Even though the latest version of PROAG is dated 2011 and it is only a proposed guide, it has been adopted by New York State DOT as standard for all new construction and all facilities built after March 15, 2012. ADAG is still the federal standard for ADA. ADAG was primarily written for buildings and building sites such as entries, entry, excuse me, entrances, stairways, doorways, and elevators. ADAG is sometimes difficult or awkward to apply to public right-of-way features in the highway env environment. So PROAG was developed specifically to address features and conditions encountered in the public right-of-way. ADAG is uh, standards apply to decide if a curb ramp is going to be left in place on a one-hour project. Any new or altered curb ramp must meet PROAG standards. This is the critical element sheet. It was also attached to an email and is available on uh, Chapter 18 of the Highway Design Manual. Values for final acceptance of ramps and other pedestrian facilities are furnished along with more conservative values that are required for design and layout of curb ramps. The Excel spreadsheet is broken down into two sections. The upper portion, the brown heading, is used for evaluating any existing ramps that will remain on one hour projects. The lower portion with the blue heading is used for all new or replaced facilities, new construction, or evaluating any existing facility that was constructed after March 15, 2012. This is an example of design and layout versus work acceptance values. These more conservative values allow for a built-in construction tolerance. There is no tolerance for acceptance values. If a ramp does not meet the acceptance value shown, it needs for with a good reason, a formal justification, or it needs to be replaced to meet the acceptance values. The 608 standard sheets have a lot of useful information for ADA requirements. On those, there's gonna be 14 standard ramp configurations, transitions between new ramps and existing sidewalk and highway surfaces, pavement reconstruction and cross sections, detectable warning placement, and ramp flare options. Next thing we're gonna go over is gonna be the anatomy of a curb ramp. We're gonna go over some of the terminology that's used in ADA guidelines. This is gonna be an example of a ramp that's at the corner of Route 5 and Erie Boulevard in Schenectady. The turning space is at the top of a ramp. Clear space is at the bottom of the ramp. The turning space is a level area that is provided where a turning maneuver is needed to orient the ramp run or direction. Not all ramps need a turning space. These guidelines rarely use the term landing in favor of turning space. They're, this clarifies the purpose and need of this feature. The clear space is located at the bottom of the lower grade break. 
That provides a safe place for a wheelchair to wait or rest before crossing the road. It is located outside the parallel vehicle lane and entirely in the crosswalk. One thing I want to go over here is, let's see here. This would be your direction of travel coming down the sidewalk to the turning space, down the ramp, into the clear space, and this is the crosswalk you're intended to cross. This is your parallel vehicle travel lane for this direction of travel. The ramp section with the detectable warning surface is at or near the lower grade break. The detectable warnings are truncated domes provided for information to visually impaired pedestrians. We're gonna discuss these later in detail. The flares are the transition from the elevated paved surface, surface to the bottom of the ramp. Not all ramps need flares, and we will discuss that later. Slopes that are discussed in the guidelines will be the running slope, which is parallel to the direction of pedestrian travel. It's what we refer to as the longitudinal grade. The cross slope is perpendicular to the direction of pedestrian travel. The flare slope is the slope of the flare parallel to the curb line. The counter slope is the slope running counter to the running slope of the ramp at the lower grade break. This is an example of a blended transition ramp. It's essentially a curb ramp with any running slope that is less than or equal to 5%. Um, one of the differences between a blended transition and a traditional curb ramp is it's essentially considered an extension of the sidewalk into the roadway and the turning space is not required for any ramp 5% or less. A pedestrian access route highlighted here in yellow is a continuous clear route that's fully accessible. It has a minimum width of 48 inches excluding the curb. It must meet all the surface and slope requirements in the guidelines. The curb ramp is a part of the access route. It should be noted the department's preferred sidewalk width is five feet. A minimum width is four foot is only used when a five foot isn't obtainable. If four foot is used, a five foot by five foot section considered a passing space is required for every 200 linear feet of four foot sidewalk. The pedestrian circulation path is a surface that is paved and walkable. It may not meet all the surface requirements of ADA. The pedestrian access route may be located within a larger pedestrian circulation path. The circulation path can be any of this. Uh, if you see here, these are pavers, stamped concrete, any hard surface that is located outside the sidewalk area. Um, these slopes here can vary, where the slope of your five foot for your, uh, your sidewalk cannot. For field inspection, you're gonna want a four foot digital level, otherwise known as a smart level, a 25 foot tape, a digital camera or cell phone with GPS enabled so that you can uh, capture the coordinates, the critical element sheet, which is that spreadsheet that I was handed out to everybody, well, it was emailed to everybody, that's available on chapter 18, that's a very uh, useful tool for your measurements, and you may need a plan or location map. New York State DOT has identified standard methods and measurements for measurements of each feature. These are available on the back of the critical element sheet. Some of the critical measurements is the ramp width, the flare slopes, the running slope, the counter slope, um, the joint widths and cracks, vertical changes, detectable warning placement, the turning space dimensions and slopes. The pedestrian circulation path comes into play when considering curb ramp flares. The pedestrian circulation path is anywhere people can be expected to walk. Anything that's paved and has no obstructions. If the flares are within the pedestrian circulation path, the flares cannot exceed 10% for work acceptance, 9.5% for design and layout. This makes the ramp traver uh, traversable as someone has to cross it perpendicular. So in this situation here, this can be either a paved snow storage, stamped concrete or pavers. A pedestrian can walk to the ramp, cross perpendicularly up this flare that can't exceed 10% onto the sidewalk. 
If the flares are located outside a paved pedestrian circulation path, they can be steeper than 10% or have a vertical surface such as curb. In both of these situations shown, the curb or flare is against an unpaved or obstructed area, so these are acceptable. To measure the flare slope, you're going to want to take an average of two measurements parallel to the curb line. To measure your running slope, um, you always want to make sure your digital smart level is calibrated. You may want to have an extra level with you or an extra set of batteries. You always want to make sure the surface is clean and free from debris. Uh, it's a good idea to broom it off before you take your measurement. Any rocks, pebbles, even sand can impact the slope at the digital level. You want to take an average of three measurements, one down the center line and one on each side 18 inches apart. You use the average of the three measurements. It's 7.5% maximum slope for design and layout, 8.3% maximum for work acceptance. Never make assumptions. In the field, this ramp looked good, but the slope was too steep. Look at the whole ramp for large horizontal cracks and joints, half inch or larger. Any vertical discontinuities or lips, quarter inch or greater. Any vertical lip can be beveled as per the standard sheets with a one on two. The counter slope is another measurement that's critical. If the slope changes at the bottom of the ramp are too abrupt, wheelchair footrest can get stuck, scrape, or even tip over. To evaluate the counter slope, the running slope of the curb ramp is added to the grade of the adjacent street. If the running slope is 8.3% of the ramp and the adjacent street is 5%, the change in grade equates to an algebraic difference of 13.3%. This is the maximum counter slope for acceptance. New York State DOT more conservative maximum for layout or design is 12.5%. If the counter slope is greater than 12.5%, for layout, a relatively flat 24 inch transition strip is required between the two, the two slopes. There are details for both of these conditions on the 608 standard sheets. The slopes are measured the same way as a running slope, center line and 18 inches down each side, and it's the average of the three measurements. Detectable warnings are one of the foremost, foremost sources of confusion and non-compliant ramp installation. The primary purpose is to notify the visually impaired pedestrians that they are leaving or crossing the boundary between the pedestrian zone and the vehicle zone. The flush curb at the curb ramp does not provide a cue for blind pedestrians um, like crossing a vertical curb would. They are not in, uh, intended to indicate the orientation of the crosswalk. They are not a universal danger warning. They shouldn't be used haphazardly or they lose their meaning for people who rely on them. They're typically placed under major vehicle and railway crossings. Detectable warnings need to cover the full 24 inch of direction across the width of the ramp. Otherwise, visually impaired pedestrians can easily step over and miss the detective warning edges. This is an example of an incorrect placement. If you look here in this corner, this piece of detective warning is missing. It needs to be 24 inches taken from this curb back to this point. It would also be 24 inches from this point here at the curb back to this point. Detectable warning placement depends on where the lower grade break of the ramp is. It's a good idea to keep the detectable warning relatively close to the crossing. The lower grade break is greater than five feet, such as the example on the left, the detectable warning is placed at the back of the curb, again covering the full 24 inches in the direction of travel across the full width of the ramp. If the lower grade break is less than five feet from the back of the curb, the unit can be placed on the ramp itself right above the lower grade break. Both of these will be examples also in the 608 standard sheets. Detectable warnings placed at the back of the curb must be within two inches of the curb or the pavement edge. Detectable warnings placed on a ramp must be within two inches of the lower grade break. A two inch border is always allowed with all detectable warnings because some manufacturers require it for proper installation. 
Along the radius, radial units can be used. Standard pre-cut radial units come in standard sizes for many common radii. On irregular curves, if radial units are not an option, rectilinear units may be cut to fit. The domes of the detectable warning do not need to be oriented for the direction of the crosswalk. Pedestrians do not use the dome as a direction cue for crossing. Detectable warnings are not meant to be used as a wayfinding device. The orientation of the dome is an issue where detectable warnings are placed on curb ramps or slopes over 5%. In these instances, they should be oriented perpendicular to the bottom grade break. This allows wheeled assisted devices to track between the domes offering less rolling resistance. The photo on the left shows a well-intended but incorrect orientation of a detectable warning unit that has been lined up with the crosswalk. The photo on the right shows the correct orientation of a detectable warning perpendicular to the lower grade break but not aligned with the crosswalk. Detectable warnings are not needed for most driveways. They can lose their effect effectiveness when overdone. In the top photo, the pedestrian right-of-way continues across the driveway, so the pedestrian is not leaving the pedestrian zone, otherwise known as the sidewalk. Detectable warnings are only needed at stop or yield control driveways. These crossings typically have higher vehicle volumes and function like an intersection, so the detectable warning should, should be placed in these locations. Next thing I'm going to cover is turning space. The turning space, outlined here in red, is the level area at the top of the ramp used to orient to the ramp run or direction of travel. ProWag calls for a minimum 48 inch by 48 inch minimum clear area. Where the turning space is constrained at the back of the sidewalk, where that green line is, um, then the minimum width becomes five feet instead of four feet. And that is always measured in the direction of the ramp run. Turning spaces of two ramps in close proximity can overlap, or a single turning space can serve two ramps. Here's an example of a constrained turning space. The dimension five foot is in the direction of the ramp run. This allows extra space for a turning maneuver in a wheelchair. A constrained space can be any obstacle, such as a fence, back curb, or building. This is an example of an unconstrained turning space where a four foot by four foot area is required. The turning space slope cannot exceed 1.5% for layout or design, or 2% for work acceptance. This is an average of three measurements taken in each direction. One down the center line and 18 inches on each side, you take an average of the three measurements. For tying in new curb ramps to existing facilities and making them compliant can be a challenge, particularly on a 1R or alteration project where the street grade is already set. Um, this is gonna be most of your maintenance paving projects, uh, simple mill and fills. Tying into an existing highway grade uh, seems to cause the most problems. The standard sheet allows for a five to 10 foot warp transition zone between the existing sidewalk and the top grade of the new ramp. This transition piece does not need to meet the slope or width standards. It is intended to allow for a fully compliant ramp and will eventually be replaced when the sidewalk is replaced at a later date. Here's an example of transitioning from a compliant ramp cross slope to a highway grade that may exceed 2%. Um, this one here is an example of a mid-block crossing. This is also from the 608 standard sheets. Um, the cross slope can match the highway grade at the bottom, but it must transition up to a compliant cross slope for the turning space. This extreme situation shows a very steep highway grade and sidewalk grade, but it shows how important the level 2% turning space is. Turning a wheelchair or walker on a sidewalk at the top image would be very difficult. Some other considerations uh, for curb ramps. The grade brakes should be perpendicular to the direction of travel for better stability of wheeled assisted devices. Concave or convex surfaces 
rounded gray breaks make it very difficult for people with low vision to read the ramp or distinguish the slope surfaces from the flat surfaces. Uh, concrete should always, shouldn't be deeply scored for traction to serve as a detectable surface. surface. Scoring does not meet the requirements for detectable surface, only domes meeting the size and spacing criteria do. Uh, and a broom finish is fine. This is an example here. If you look, right, this here was kind of rounded. You don't want to do that. You want to square off the edges, and you want a square grade break at the top. Poor drainage can make an otherwise compliant ramp inaccessible. Adequate drainage is a critical element. Sometimes 2% slopes are not enough to drain a ramp. With formal justification, slopes can exceed the maximums to ensure adequate drainage. This is an example of a type 1 ramp. The running slope, which is this direction here, is less than or equal to 8.3%. The cross slope, which was measured here, is less than or equal to 2%. The counter slope, which is the difference of these two directions here, was less than 13.3%. The flares here in the pedestrian circulation path are less than 10%. The ramp width was more than 48 inches. Um, there's no change in direction, so there's no turning space required at the top of this ramp. If there was another ramp going in this direction, this would need the turning space that needs to meet the slope requirements. Um, one of the issues with this was the grade was not flush throughout. This is a common mistake in the field. Um, when the curb is poured, it's brought up too high. And if you see this little red area, that lip is greater than a quarter of an inch. Uh, in some situations, if you can catch that before the sidewalk is poured, this can be saw cut. If not, the ramp needs to come out. Then you need to saw cut, re-pour the ramp. This was another mistake. The detectable warning did not cover the full 24 inches in the direction of travel. Here it does, here it does not. It needs to be 24 inches lined up perpendicular to the direction of travel. This is an example of a type seven ramp. The running slope was less than or equal to 8.3%. The cross slope is less than or equal to 2%. Um, in this situation, this is a signalized intersection. You are allowed to have the cross slope greater than 2%. It can match highway grade. The ramp width here was greater than 48 inches. The clear space, which is going to be right here for the direction of travel, it's this direction. This is your four foot clear space. It's outside of the parallel vehicle travel lane, which is parallel to the direction of traffic for the pedestrian. Um, here again, the grade was not flush. It's more than a quarter inch lip. So this ramp fails. The turning space, it is 60 inches to the back of the building. Um, but the problem here is there's a the signal pole for the uh, the ped button falls within the 48 inches, so that ramp fails because of that. Um, the other issue, this is very common, the detectable warning. If you notice this little area right in here, uh, it's more than two inches away from the curb, so this ramp also fails because of that. Use a standard approach for photo documentation. Keep in mind, if a non-standard feature justification is required, photos are required. These are very useful if you need to supply supplemental information to the EIC. Uh, two views are always good. You want an approach from the crosswalk, an approach close up. Number each ramp and tie it into the plans or field inspection sheet if your region uses one. So you can coordinate them with the field sheets to make a field evaluation package. If you realize a curb ramp or other facility isn't going to meet ADA guidelines, first thing you want to do is notify the EAC. If it's a minor issue, the ramp may be able to be made compliant. If it's a more significant issue or there's question about compliance, then the regional ADA compliance specialist should be consulted. It may need a redesign or it may be that there's no physical way that that facility can meet the standards. If the ramp feature cannot be made compliant, a non-standard feature justification is required. The valid reasons for this will be underlying terrain, right-of-way availability, underground structures such as utilities, adjacent to developed facilities, which could be a, a building within the right-of-way that's in close proximity to the sidewalk, drainage, presence of a notable natural feature, presence of a notable historic feature, 
or other, such as a religious site or in extreme situations where the cost of doing one pedestrian facility for a ramp may exceed 20% of the overall project cost. These are a list of some of the references, ED15004, the 608 standard sheets, Highway Design Manuals Chapter 2, Chapter 7, and Chapter 18. Chapter 18 is going to be your pedestrian section, um, the critical elements tables in there, and ED15004 is also in there, and there's some frequently asked questions in there. Speaking of questions, uh, we're at that point now. If anybody has any questions or would like to discuss anything, now would be your time. 